This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is Twim, This Week in Microbiology, episode 134, recorded on September 1st, twenty. 16. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,500 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. This episode is also brought to you by Drobo, a family of safe, expandable, Yet, simple to use storage arrays. Drobos are designed to protect your important data forever. Visit drobo.com to learn more. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello there. Happy How September. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> where, did the, where did the time go? The whole summer sped by. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Do you like September? Well, there is a home football game this weekend. We've got that to look forward to. Who are you playing? Hawaii. Is that the first game of the season? It is. So all the all the, Be under, gentle. All the undergrads are back, right? Well, they're moving in now. Uh-huh. Town is pretty crazy with all the... Sport utility vehicles being unloaded on the streets. I moved three kids into college this fall. Wow. We'll send money. Please, please do. I'm broke. Oh, my gosh. Uh, tuition. Oh, my gosh. Also, Where trying- would you rather spend your money than on your kids' education? Uh, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I, I'm happy to do it. I, I just I told my older son, please, he's a senior. I said, please take it seriously. It doesn't cost any less for your senior year. <laughs> Probably not the best thing to say. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Where there's a hurricane impinging, right? Yep. T- tomorrow Ouch. we're going to have high water, I think. You're far inland, aren't you? No, I am literally look out my window and can see water. Wow. I didn't, why did I think you're not on the coast? Well, uh, good luck. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. It's not a big one, though, right? No, it's coming through the Gulf and is going to come across Georgia, and hopefully it'll lose much of its energy before it hits Charleston, and it goes straight out to sea and all the way over to Bermuda and keeps moving on up. Well, hope your lab is okay. And yep. you're your home, too. Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? Today we have a snippet and a paper for you, and our snippet was suggested by our listener, Nathan who wrote, Dear Vincent, Elio, Michelle, and Michael, thank you all for the wonderful podcast. It's a great gift to humanity and science communication. It would be great if you could discuss the really interesting paper by Din et al., recently published in Nature. TWIV listeners know about viral-based anti-cancer therapies and successes such as Amgen's TVEC. Now, here's a bacterial-based approach. Keep on podcasting, Nathan in Chapel Hill. TVEC is a recently FDA-approved herpes virus to treat melanoma, the first in the U.S. anyway, the first licensed uh, anti-tumor virus, and um, there'll be a lot more of those for sure. Paper Nathan sent, Synchronized Cycles of Bacterial Lysis for In Vivo Delivery. And the first author is M. Omar Din, and the last author is Jeff Hasty. and this comes out of UCSD, not too far from ALIO, uh, mm-hmm. MIT, uh, let's see, yeah, the Howard Hughes and Chevy Chase, and Columbia, well, one of the authors just moved to Columbia University. How about that? Nice. And this is a very interesting paper where they say, can we use bacteria to deliver therapeutic agents to tissues? And they wanted to make bacteria that would grow and then lice all at the same time, and then a few would remain and these would grow. So they would go through these, as they call, synchronized cycles, which you hear in the title. And what they have done is to develop a two-plasmid system to do this, right? And 
one of the plasmids has a promoter. It's called the Lux I promoter. And that drives the production of a protein that is what we call an autoinducer because it activates that same promoter. The Lux I promoter is activated by the gene product uh, that's driven by transcription. Uh, and then there is a second uh, gene where the same promoter is used to drive a phage lysis gene. So the Lux I promoter will also drive the lysis gene, which of course would, would end up lysing the cell. And the idea is that then you would have a second plasmid with your therapeutic gene also driven uh, by the same promoter. Now, the idea would be that as the population grows, you have a slow buildup of this autoinducer that activates the Lux I promoter. And then at some level, it activates the lysis uh, promoter and then the bacteria lyse. And they actually demonstrate this. They, use, they introduce these plasmids into an attenuated Salmonella enterica strain. Uh, and they, in fact, and they use a green fluorescent protein to monitor the um, growth and lysis of the population. And they see that, in fact, this works. The bacteria grow, they reach a certain point, and then they lyse, and then a few of them that remain begin to grow again. You see this lovely graph of increases and decreases in fluorescence. So they can actually build this system to get synchronized growth and lysis of the bacteria. And a lot of this work is done using microfluidics, high technology, uh, to measure the growth uh, of the bacteria. So next thing that they do is incorporate a payload into the pla one of these plasmids that's cytotoxic. And what they used here is um, a hemolysin encoded by E. coli, which is called hemolysin E. And it's been shown by others in other studies that it forms not only pores, but it, it's anti-tumor. It has anti-tumor activity. And they showed that, in fact, if you co-culture the bacteria, again, which is a salmonella strain, with HeLa cells, these are of course, transformed cell lines made many years ago. Simply co-culture these bacteria with the HeLa cells, you get lysis of the HeLa cells. So the bacteria are able to release enough of the hemolysin to kill the HeLa cells. And in fact, they show that if they take the supernatant of these bacteria and simply add it to HeLa cells, it's enough to lyse them. They take the supernatant from a bacterial strain where there's no hemolysin encoded on the plasma, it doesn't lyse them. So it's a very nice control. All right, so this is all. You're going you're gonna to tell us very soon how to make this uh, specific to cancer cells, right? I am, yeah. So now we're going to move into animals. We're going to move into a mouse model and we're going to ask can we kill cancer cells? So they, now they've incorporated a luciferase reporter uh, into, the, into the bacteria so they can use that as a, a way of monitoring the population of bacteria. And they use a mouse which has a subcutaneous colorectal cancer. So they've taken a cell line, a colorectal cancer cell line, and they inject it subcutaneously into the mouse and it grows. It makes tumors and they get big enough so that you can intratumorally inject the bacteria into it. They've, made, they've done a cool thing that so yeah, everyone probably knows that to keep plasmids in cells, you often need to have an antibiotic resistance marker on the plasma. They did an interesting trick uh, so that you don't need to keep antibiotics around to maintain the plasmids. So they actually, when they inject the bacteria into the tumor directly, these are the salmonella that we've been talking about that have the two plasmid system, they see the pulsating bacterial population dynamics within the tumor. They grow, they disappear, they grow, and they can monitor this, monitor this uh, with, with luciferase. So it seems to work uh, inside a tumor. And in fact, the tumor does seem to well, so far we were just looking at population uh, dynamics. Uh, and next they want to know if you can actually decrease the size of the tumor. So they they add two other molecules to this system. So, so far we have hemolysin. They also have, uh, they add a protein uh, that recruits T cells and dendritic cells. And then they have a protein that induces apoptosis. And they have a peptide which... Uh, specifically targets the the death inducing protein to tumor cells. Okay, so then they test each of these plasmids alone within the bacteria, of course, and then in, in combination, and they find that all three together have the highest effect at eliminating this or decreasing the size of the tumor 
uh, in mice. And again, they can inject these intratumorally. And if you have all three elements, the hemolysin, the immune recruiter, and the uh, apoptosis-inducing protein, you get a real decrease in the tumor size. And you can see that there are bacteria growing in the tumor, and they oscillate, as we've said. It can actually reduce the size of the tumor, so that's pretty neat. And this um, triple strain, by the way, whether they, in, they, they inoculate intratumorally or even intravenously, doesn't seem to affect the mice. It doesn't decrease their weight. It doesn't kill them. So, you know, as, as far as that goes... How do you actually, how do you explain that? Isn't that kind of unexpected? Well, I think they, they, they originally said that this was an attenuated salmonella strain. Oh, I see. So oh, I, see. I think that's the key. And if you mm. had used wild type, it probably would have done something, right? Right. Yeah, that's my guess. Is its LPS attenuated or is it still going to trigger inflammation? I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. Mm. Well, they call it as an attenuated. They don't even give a reference for it, actually. Maybe let's see if it's in the, in the um, methods. If they have it very clearly at the beginning. Strains. Here we go. Salmonella. Yeah, they just give it a strain name. So I, I don't know. SL1344. So I don't know the answer to that. What's the significance of the answer to that, Michelle? Well, um, in general, if you have bacteria growing in your bloodstream, we call that sepsis. Mm -hmm. um, it can trigger fever, and if the levels are high enough, um, serious uh, shock, toxic mm -hmm. shock. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm curious how they're thinking about that. Yeah. Well, so, that particular strain is an ATCC strain, SL1344. I just did a little quick Google on mm -hmm, it, mm -hmm. and it doesn't appear that if if it is as Michelle is suspecting had an attenuated LPS, I would have thought I the Google would have hit, hinted towards that, but I haven't mm. stumbled into that. So my guess, Michelle, is that it's got full potent LPS that would trick the light fantastic when it hits the back of our heads. But maybe the macrophages and the, and the neutrophils in the bloodstream take care of most of it. Also remember yeah. there's the, the way this is built is that the, the bacteria lice at a certain density. Right. Right. So they're self-limiting and they say that could be part of why this doesn't have an effect. I mean, they do admit that they have to do more work on, on the effect and on general host health, but they think the design, this synchronous growth in lysis, it's probably uh, part of why they're, uh, they have as few host effects as they see. But remember, that's the common effect when you treat an individual with one of these really um, high titer gram negative type infections like treponema pallidum or more affectionately known as syphilis. And when you give them that um, massive dose of penicillin, it triggers massive lysis of the spirochetes within the bloodstream because that's where the spirochetes are running around. And that actually can send people into shock. So a reaction. That's right. Hmm. Well, clearly they need to address these issues, right? Yeah. Before moving on. It's a very bold and clever strategy. It's very bold. I'll say. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, the people are taking viruses and injecting them into tumors or even intravenously. And um, I would say that's as bold also because um, in, in many cases they have to modify the virus so they don't cause disease. So, Well, the, in, on, on the spectrum of news about immunotherapy for cancer, uh, there emerges this very old study from the turn of the 19th century, 20th century by Cooney, who injected live, what was it, uh, Michael, you probably remember, into tumors and, the tw and, and he cured people sometimes. Mm. It was called Cooney's mm. toxin, but there were live bacteria. So anyhow, that's being resurrected. So we're going to hear much more about this certainly, general topic certainly. of So it may bacteria. be that, that periodic lysis is actually good and it recruits the immune system to help. Could be. Yeah. Do mm. the cleaning, yeah. cleaning up of the cancer. It may be the key thing here. And, and of course, they've added a, a protein that recruits T cells and dendritic cells, and on top of it, which they found made a big difference. So that could probably, that's important. Their last experiment, they have a mouse model where there are colorectal tumor metastases in the liver. They inject these mice in the spleen with these tumor cells. They metastasize to the liver, and then they uh, simply infect these animals intravenously or orally 
with the salmonella containing the two plasmids. And this is based on previous observations that anaerobic bacteria can go to tumor compartments that don't have a lot of blood supply, where chemotherapy is usually not good at reaching this, right? But it's been previously shown that the bacteria, anaerobic bacteria at least, can get there. So they said, well, let's try giving these mice these anaerobes and combination with a, a chemotherapeutic agent, 5-fluorouracil, you know, which gets to the vascularized regions of a tuber, but not to the avascular regions. So they gave the mice, again, with these liver metastases, either 5-fluorouracil by oral or, uh, so the, the bacteria went in orally and the 5-FU went in ID. They gave separate IV, sorry, separately or together. And together, the bacteria and the 5-FU uh, gave a huge decrease in tumor activity for about 18 days. And then after that, the, the tumor started to grow again. But uh, there was about a 30% reduction in the tumor over those 18-day periods when you put both treatments in together, but not either one alone. So it's the idea here, it suggests that the 5-FU is killing the vascularized part of the tumor, and then maybe the bacteria are doing both. And remember, this is administered orally. <laughs> wow, these it's, it's incredible. And they're homing to the source. And... Yeah, it's incredible that they're homing. That's the thing that, that really struck me, that they're homing to these avascular compartments. I mean, just, just reminding people that salmonella is not a strict anaerobe, but it's a facultative anaerobe, so it yeah. can grow anaerobically. Yeah. And it's also a facultative intracellular parasite, so it's right. adapted to growing inside of our cells, and it's really optimized for getting around some of our primary defense systems to right. do what it needs to do. And Elio, to answer your question, it was William Cooley, and he injected <laughs> Cooley. He injected Cooley, strep, right. streptococcal organisms into the patient with, um, if I'm remembering right, uh, uh, sarcomas, bone sarcomas. That's right. That's right. And uh, he's uh, my dear immunologist friends uh, alerted me to him when I was a young faculty member here because he's the father of immunotherapy. Mm. Right. Because your immune system and the streptococci are effectively wreaking havoc, and then your immune system is effectively what um, cleans up mm. or debulks yeah. yeah. debulks the tumor. And that's what chemotherapy is all about. It's all about debulking the offending agent, whether it be a bacterium in the case of what we do with antibiotics or in this particular case where we're using bacteria to facilitate the debulking of the tumor. Right. Now, many of the anti-tumor anti virus approaches, they add immune modulators. So the virus is killing the tumor, it's producing these immune modulators that bring in immune cells and they continue the killing as well. And some of them so it's two, two for one design. Yeah. And some yeah. of them even include a drug convertase so that you could treat someone with a prodrug and then an enzyme made specifically in the tumor would convert right. the drug to an active form, and it's very specific for the tumor. So I, I suspect that these bacterial strains are going to be modified in similar ways in the next coming years. But I mean, that's basically the paper, which I think there's a lot to do. Obviously, they didn't look in these mice if, if salmonella is elsewhere, for example, where they give it orally. They didn't talk about whether there are any other effects, but pretty promising, I think. I think it's quite interesting. And, and they like they emphasize that this synchronized cycle property of, of this strain that they've produced uh, is the key to its safety, that it's self-limiting. And when it lyses, it delivers the drug. So thank you for pointing that out, Nathan. Uh, that is very cool. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about as, uh, that as we go along here. Well, it's a lovely combination of deep thinking about yeah. uh, systems biology, if as it were, this business of oscillating systems and the, the use of all this technology. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's just a lovely well, combination. You know, it, it, it takes all the basic things we know about regulation of gene expression, right, and bacterial growth, right. and then it uses it to address a clinical right. problem. And this is the right. best of all worlds. Uh, before we go on to our paper, I want to tell you about our sponsor of this episode, Curiosity Stream. They're the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service. They have over 1,500 titles, and it was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Channel. So if you're familiar with that, you know that you're going to get real science, not reality TV. It's available on the web, 
or on your favorite device like Apple TV or the Roku or Android or iOS devices available in 196 content. And they have a lot of science and technology. They have nature. They have history and interviews and lectures even. For example, they have Stephen Hawking's Universe. This is a series where he traces the history of astronomical theories, deep time history, a three-part series about the 14 billion year history of the universe and underwater wonders of the national parks. I don't know if you knew, but this year is the hundredth anniversary of the U S national park service. And this is a, a series in celebration of that. It takes you underneath the bodies of water uh, in the national parks. They also have a very large 4k library. That's super high definition. They have over 40 hours of that. Now they have monthly and annual plans. They start at just two ninety nine a month. And of course, that is less than a cup of coffee or one single title on any of the competing platforms. So check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two months free of one of the largest 4K libraries, nonfiction 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the offer code microbe at sign up. We thank Curiosity Stream for their support of TWIM. Now, Alio has something to tell us. I do. <laughs> I don't want to steal and it. The name of the, 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 of the chemicals that I'm going to talk about are the hopanoids. They have nothing to uh, do with beer, right? For all of, <laughs> here's a quiz for you guys. What is stranger? The fact that hopanoids are the most abundant organic compounds on the planet, or that despite being of microbial origins, most microbiologists have barely heard of them, which is stranger. <laughs> Both, right? It's weird. I mean, here we have compounds which are present to the tune of 10 to the 12 tons, okay, and are virtually... Un unknown. If not unknown, people have heard of them. Maybe, maybe they haven't. Uh, obviously, Mike knows all about it because he knows well, everything. Well, <laughs> we're most grateful every time we go to the gas pump and fill up our car because we're burning hopanoids every well, time we... not quite. No, 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 not quite. <laughs> you are using hopanoid and you're lubricating oil. They're, they're too big. They have between 30 and 35 carbons. So wow. you wouldn't want to put them in the gas tank necessarily. Well, but, my gasoline but is, is, ref, is refined, and, and uh, it's a neat way. I learned about them when um, I taught a course called Pollution Microbiology, and it was oh. a way of tracking oil, right. crude That's oil right. spills. Right. And our good friend Ron Atlas could probably go on for hours about these. Probably. But most microbiologists are mildly unaware of the fact that this bacterial product is the most abundant organic compound on earth. I, so did, what are, I did not know that. Okay. What are they? Well, they are cyclic molecules that look like cholesterol, but with an extra ring. Cholesterol has four rings, and uh, these guys, hopanoids, have five rings and some side chains. Okay? So there's a collection of side chains, and they all, the basic structure is called a hopane, which is named for a guy named Hope, who found these guys in some plant. Anyhow, Hopane is the basic structure. Hopanoids is this large collection of derivatives uh, of hopane. And there are many, as I say, many varieties. They are made today by one in about six species of bacteria. And they are constituents of membranes. Now, what's, what's this like? Well, it's like steroids being constituents of eukaryotic membranes. These guys are similar to steroids in that they're planar molecules, they're flat. And they can readily intercalate in the lipid domains of membranes. So they are part of uh, the membranes of the cells that make them. And in the case of gram negatives, they're mainly in the outer membrane. They like lipid A, which is a constituent of LPS of the outer membrane. So what do they do? Well, just like sterols in uh, eukaryotic cells, they're thought to be membrane stiffeners. That's what cholesterol does in eukaryotic membranes, and it's probably what hopanoids do here. And so uh, this matters because if you have only phospholipids as the only lipids, the membranes at high temperature become too fluid, and this impairs cell growth and the well-being of cells. So by intercalating hopanoids, 
you stiffen the membranes and so they can grow at higher temperature. And sure enough, the thought is that there's evidence for that all over the place. Now, um, oddly, crossing, going across the Great Barrier, it turns out that the few uh, bacteria require steroids, namely mycoplasma, some mycoplasmas, not all. And it turns out that instead of feeding them steroids, you can feed them hoponoids. So here you have it that in bacteria you can, either molecule, class of molecules can play the game. Okay, so they're made uh, at relatively low levels. They usually are only 1% or 5% of the lipids, but they can rise to very high levels when stressed. Like uh, one of my favorite bacteria is Zymomonas, which is an alcohol-making and alcohol-resistant bacterium. And in the presence of high alcohol content, in this uh, the hoponoid um, content can raise to 50% of the lipids. Anyhow, so there are, uh, they're made in, uh, they're associated with specific ecological niches. And one of the hoponoids, which is 2 methyl hoponoid, is found in organisms that are involved in plant microbe symbiotic relationships. So this is kind of interesting today. Okay? So they're found, uh, in general, they're found in, uh, also in actinomycetes which make aerial mycelium, that is, they have filaments that stick up uh, up in the air and make spores. And uh, this is related to the hoponoid content. And they're also found in Bacillus subtilis as the sporulate. So these particular hoponoids, two methyl hoponoids, are enriched in communities which are low in oxygen and fixed nitrogen with high osmolarity, among others. Okay, that's today. Mm. So why are there so many? The reason there's so many is because they do not decompose, even across almost the longest ge geologic periods. So there's some hoponoids are found in rocks which are about 2.4 billion years old. Now, no wonder there's so much of it. <laughs> even if they're made in small amounts, accumulation counts. Okay, so uh, they just are made in relatively small amounts perhaps, but they don't decompose. They are there forever. And so are steroids. All kinds of steroids. They, they get the rivertized. They get changed as the rocks weather. But the basic uh, backbone of the molecules is stable. I have no idea why it's stable, by the way. Uh, but that's organic chemistry for you. I mean, that's, they, look, they look like they should be highly unstable, don't they? But so you have it. So they're important for as biomarkers for paleontology studies. They are molecular fossils, and they indicate the bacteria activity way back two billion plus years ago. Okay, so um, you can see why these are important and exciting, and we should pay more attention to them. I hope you agree with me, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, for sure. Okay, so anyhow, there is a lot of conversation that has gone on about whether the, these can, have been, were made in the only when oxygen was present. And this is a tantalizing idea because these guys are, were present before the great oxygen revolution, mm -hmm. which was what, about two billion years ago. So was, is it possible that there was some oxygen before the cyanobacteria went to town and produced the amounts of oxygen that we... Uh, we think of the very high amounts of oxygen. This notion was kind of disproved by the fact that the non-oxygenic photosynthesizer, make, uh, Rhodosudomonas palostris, makes such compounds anaerobically and it makes them in good amounts. Mm. So whatever, they're not a marker for oxygen being present, but um, they're stand-ins for bacteria and fossils, just like steroids or degradation products of steroids, the steranes are markers for eukaryotes. So uh, it gets a little bit complicated because they, as I say, they change in composition with, with the weather, with, with weathering, not with the weather. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about them, but let me sort of sum up why this is so unusual. These are molecules that are so outranked in terms of biological role by the information molecules. 
they, you know, nucleic acids and proteins seem to be so much more central to the well-being of cells, essential is what, what we understand as life, whereas these guys are not made by all bacteria, they're made by some, they are dispensable in the case of most, and yet they become the most abundant microbial product on Earth. Just, just for a second, let's, let's take a little second and figure out what would happen if DNA could survive two billion years. Mm -hmm. What do you think? We'd have dinosaurs. Theories on evolution. Well, there'd be a lot of DNA around because there's, there's, from what I understand, there's much more DNA in a cell than a hopinoid, right? Of course. By a big, yeah. Well, uh, depends on the cell. Yeah. But still, there would be, but what would it do to our theories? What to our, um, all the thinking that's going into evolution and uh, whether, you know, which 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 cell came first, and what is Luca like? The last universal common ancestor. Right. So the, the fact that every DNA would still be around would be a problem. Yeah. Well, horizontal gene transfer then becomes very important because if the DNA is still DNA, you right. could literally slice and dice it in, and exactly. you could have evolution horizontally rather than vertically. Right. And it so would be this risky for phenomenal. our genomes. The fact is, it doesn't yeah. happen. That claims that you can find. Uh, uh, DNA in ancient ambers, but I don't think they'd be totally substantiated. Anyhow, and those are only 30 million years old or 100 million years old. I think in uh, salt formations, there's also some very ancient DNA, but nothing like 2 billion years. Okay. So, But uh, if all the DNA that ever existed were still around, it would be a lot easier for us to sort out evolutionary patterns, right? Exactly. We wouldn't have to argue. <laughs> with which, Michelle. Is actually, which is actually their motivation for understanding hopinoids because they are present so if we understood them better we could then deduce um evolution of life and bacteria and that's very true okay so the um there's a paper by richie morton kulkarni summers and diane newman and these are folks who work at caltech and at Cal State Northridge, which is in a suburb of LA. And uh, these, la these labs have written uh, quite a few papers on the subject. So has, um, oh my goodness, Paula Willander, who's now at Stanford. Anyhow, uh, they, cl they say to understand, just the point that, um, that Michelle made, to understand the evolution of hoponoids, you ought to have a look at hoponoids today. In, in, in understand what they're doing and not doing. So they take a cyanobacterium, a filamentous cyanobacterium, Nostoc, fun guy, a fun organism really, and they make mutants with it. And so they make mutants with two kinds of mutants. One is in a gene SHC, which renders the cells unable to make any hoponoids. And the other one is in a an enzyme which adds a methyl group to hoponoids, HPNP. Okay, so what happens? Let's, let's look first at the um, guy who's mutated in making hoponoids at all. Well, at normal temperatures, then nothing happens. But at high temperature, the mutant does not grow very well. On the other hand, at low temperature, it grows better. <laughs> so as if hoponoids are in the way at low temperatures. Mm -hmm. So this is consistent with the idea that uh, hoponoids are membrane rigidifiers. Okay, so that's pretty good. But uh, aside from temperature stress, hoponoids seem to be dispensable under other stress conditions like osmotic shock. I believe there's uh, pH, no, um, several kinds of, of uh, other than temperature, it doesn't matter. Hoponoids don't seem to matter. However, there is one uh, aspect of Nostoc biology, which I should remind you of, namely that they make a spore-like structure, a cell, uh, which is called an akinete. I don't know why it's called an akinete. I guess it means it doesn't move. Mm. It's a resting survival cell. And here, two methylated hoponoids, which can be studied by the mutant, which adds a methyl group to hoponoids, do not contribute to stress phenomena. But total hoponoids do uh, promote the formation of granules called cyanophysin granules. 
which are typical of echinis. I'd never heard of them. So I had to look them up. These are polyamino acid granules, which are used, they're of course rich in carbon and rich in nitrogen, and they are used as carbon and nitrogen storage. So hopanoids, uh, two methyl hopanoids promote the formation of these granules, suggesting that they are involved in the uh, storage of nitrogen and maybe carbon. So this and I'll is... I'll just add that these granules are visible through light microscopy. So one right. of the approaches they used was to culture the wild type or the mutants and then um, count directly how many granules per cell. Right. So very, so very kind of elegant, need... simple yeah. it, analysis. It, tells you that you, you, it helps to know some biology, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the biology of Nostoc is actually more, it's even more exciting than this because they do other things. They have heterocysts, the nitrogen fixing cells, and other things. Anyhow, the, uh, they also ask another question. There seems to be a connection between hopanoids supporting symbiotic relationships. And this is true for alpha proteobacteria like rhizobia and plants. Okay? But here, Nostoc is not an alpha proteobacterium. And so the question is, how general is that phenomenon? Well, Nostoc and a thing called a hornworth, wort, hornwort, which is a little plant. I guess it's a bryophyte, is it? I should look it up. Anyhow, they have a symbiotic relationship. And here, it doesn't look like hopanoids have anything to do with the symbiosis, unlike pro alpha proteobacteria and plants. So... They are, what are they? So their thought is for, it's very um, tentative thought at time, at, at this time, is that hopins and hopanoids are general environmental stress biomarkers. So if um, this idea that hopanoid enhance nitrogen rich storage product, if this turns out to be true in other organisms, then we should know more about these uh, two methyl hopanes, and this can tell us something about the disruption of nutrient cycling via nitrogen accumulation. So here we have it. There is, on the one hand, uh, descriptive studies where people take rocks, grind them up, do lipid extracts, and analyze for the presence of hopanoids and derive conclusions from that. On the other hand, there are studies about today, and there are a few labs, but I got to tell you that it's kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. I did a PubMed search for hopanoid. I, I guess, guess how many entries I got? Mm, 50? Not bad. 102. <laughs> okay. How many? The factor of two is fine here. Yeah, yeah. it's not a <laughs> what lot. What happens if you enter DNA in Google? Oh, tens of thousands, right? Tens of thousands. Millions. Try 1.4 million. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, this is the underdog. I mean, this is a set of molecules that require much more attention. There are relatively few labs working on it. They do beautiful work. I mean, the labs that I know of, I know the uh, Diane Newman's lab and Paula Willander's lab and, um, and this guy at uh, Northridge, uh, Summers. I mean, these are, these are wonderful labs, but they are, you know, not exactly, this is not exactly on the front page of the New York Times. Well, it's probably not easy to get funded for working on hopanoids. Unless you're in the oil industry. Yeah. I think, I think the oil industry has been doing a lot of work on hopanoids. And if you Google hopanoids and oil, Google gives you 42,000 hits uh, straight off the bat. It's because of and oil. It, it's because of the oil. And it's it's useful to – predict what the oil is going to be, whether or not it's going to be sweet oil or whether oh, yeah. it's going to be the nasty, heavy stuff that takes a lot of... Bitumen. Uh, Bitumen. Bitumentous, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. so You're it, right. It's, That's right. So it does, really it does matter from a practical point of view for the petroleum industry. One thing that impressed me about this paper is they um, had some indications that the hopanoids were doing more than just um, acting as a structural role in the membrane. They implied that they may have an indirect effect on nutrient acquisition or cycling and a couple other things. So they have some data yeah. indicating that hopanoids are um, playing much larger roles than are currently appreciated. So that's certainly a reason to um, to 
understand them better. Yeah, I would think that if you tamper with membrane structure, like by adding these strange molecules to the lipid bilayer, that this is going to have some other consequences just other than just fluidity. Yeah. Right. Mm. And so maybe they're important for stabilizing, I don't know, nutrient transporters in the membrane, and maybe that accounts for mm. some of the indirect effects they saw. Mm. But sure. a- another um, thing that complicates this research, at least in the Nostock biology, um, is how difficult it is to make the mutants. So I was able to speak with um, Jessica Ritchie, who was the first author on this paper. This was um, part of her thesis research with um, Diane Newman. And she was really grateful for the collaboration that she established with Mike Summers, who is the Nostock genetics expert. So um, Jessica's previous work had indicated that um, this HNPP um, gene was a good indicator of um, this pathway, and she had used it to do a lot of really interesting phylogenetic analysis that led them to conclude that hopinoids um, are not solely um, functioning in the cyanobacteria, but have a much broader role and are more ancient. But in any case, um, she really credits um, her collaboration with, with Mike Summers, and um, they're teaching her how to, how to make the mutants. She said it, it took her six months um, to make the mutants, okay. and once she had them, she felt great, um, and then <laughs> could go on and do the research. Um, let me tell you a little more about Jessica. She is a native of uh, New Jersey. She was an undergrad at Rutgers, and there she was fortunate to uh, work in the lab of Costa Venturini um, for three years. So his lab focuses on microbes in the deep sea geothermal sites. And over the course of her three years, she contributed to four articles from that lab, and she worked closely with a number of graduate students who all encouraged her to apply to premier graduate programs. So she was appreciative for their mentoring and encouragement. So in Diane Newman's lab, she um, was uh, awarded an NSF fellowship. She authored three research articles and a review. And Diane wrote that her work really changed our thinking about which organisms were the ancestral sources of these two methyl hopanes in the rock record and which types of organisms are producing them and, and uh, potential functions. So, um, Jessica uh, had a terrific graduate career there. She especially appreciated the opportunity to take a summer course called the International Geobiology Course that is um, a consortium of universities contribute to. But there you spent a month doing field studies. She went to Yellowstone and collected samples from the hot springs there, which is where hopinoids were first discovered, and also worked um, with biologists out on Catalina Island off the coast of L.A. And many of the samples that she collected in that summer course, she actually um, used and analyzed in her first um, paper of her thesis research. And then she later returned to Yellowstone to collect more um, samples for the um, for her thesis uh, projects. And she described it as, as a really terrific experience because she was out with um, geologists, biologists. Um, they were taking cruises in the Catalina Channel to collect samples and also in Yellowstone finding layers of rock of different color. And then they'd collect, they'd dissect out samples, pencil-sized eraser, um, pencil eraser sized samples of rock that they would hmm. either immediately treat with liquid nitrogen so they could do RNA analysis or they'd ship them back to the lab to do um, PCR to, to look at the prevalence um, of one of the hopinoid biosynthetic genes. Um, currently, so she graduated, uh, earned her PhD about a year ago, and she's currently teaching at a private high school in the LA area. She teaches chemistry, biology, and AP biology. She is one of three PhDs on the faculty at this high school. And when I asked her if she had any advice for other um, uh, graduate students who are thinking about what they want to do for their, their career, she encourage them to just reach out to private high schools in their area, offer to come into the classroom and lead a project in a particular field. So in her case, she made um, Winogradsky columns, which are these um, simple columns that you can use to study microbial ecology. And there are a number of um, websites that can lead you through. So she um, brought this activity into the classroom, led the students through it. They loved it. And she also then got a chance to see what it would be like working with um, 
teenagers. <laughs> she found that she loved it, and um, that's that's what she's doing now. That's cool. Yeah. What a great story. It's nice. What a great I think it's story. great when high school teachers have done research, so they actually right. understand it and science and so forth, the discovery process. It's really important. Yeah. I, don't, I thought I went to a pretty good high school, but I don't believe there were any PhDs. Yeah. But, you know, this... This is so relevant to today's concern that we may have uh, too many unemployed PhDs. This tells you that there is room for quite a few. You know, this is Absolutely. this is a model. You know, the other thing that I love to consider is the how this is a combination of biology and geology. Mm-hmm. By the way, the paper was published in the journal Geobiology, of which Diane Newman is a an editor. Uh, so I like this very much because it does it does talk to the globality of microbiology, to the fact that this is not just a laboratory science which deals with human disease and things like that. It is so pervasive. The whole globe is influenced by it. And this kind of study just tells you that. that you, cannot, you cannot be a geologist without being a microbiologist. Mm. I, guess, I guess you can be a microbiologist without being a geologist, but that's at your own loss. <laughs> yeah. And to your point, I've included in the show notes um, a link to the International Geobiology course. It's open to any researchers, although they do uh, preferentially um, admit uh, graduate students. But I've also included a public lecture that was recently given um, at a jointly sponsored colloquium on climate change and microbial ecosystems. So this is a lecture by Paul Falkowski, and it is entitled Life's Engines, How Microbes Make Earth Habitable. And it's for the general public. It's a terrific lecture that discusses how microbes contributed to the evolution of life on Earth. And I I highly recommend it. Nice. Thank you. All right. I want to tell you about our other sponsor of this episode, Drobo. They make storage devices for your computer to hold on to your data. And they are designed to solve two problems affecting hard drives. They get full and they fail. Drobo addresses these because, first of all, they're expandable. You can put multiple hard drives in. They all are fused together into one large storage unit. And as you run out of space, you simply slot in more hard drives. They're data aware. They know how much room you have. There's a light on the front for each drive. It's green if they have if you have room. It's yellow if you're getting close to being full. And then when it's red, it's full. And when it's yellow or red, you just slide in another hard drive. It gets incorporated into the storage unit. And finally, it's redundant. If one of your drives in this unit fails, you simply pull it out, put a new one in, and all the data are restored because it's all the data are duplicated to get, uh, across all the hard drives. And most of all, it's simple to use. You don't have to be the IT person to use it. If you can understand a traffic light, you can use a Drobo. Green, orange, yellow, or red. Now, Drobo has a family of eight products, and which one you get depends on what you want to do. If you're a photographer, you're making lots of big image files. You could get a five-slot storage unit with high-speed interfaces. They have a portable unit, two pounds for carrying out in the field. They have huge units, up to 12 storage bays for backing up or storing a lot of stuff. And they also have a network-attached storage unit, the Drobo 5N. You plug into your switch or router, and it's available throughout your home. Now, listeners of TWIM can save $100 off on their purchase of a Drobo Mini 5D 5N or any 8 or 12 drive system. Just go to drobostore.com and use the discount code MICROBE100. We thank Drobo for their support of TWIM. Read you a couple of emails that we have got here. The first is from Cindy. Hi, TWIMers. I'm finally writing to say how much I enjoy your podcast after a, a year of listening. I was just listening to the latest episodes for a while because I'm lazy and you have years of podcasts to go through, but you weren't updating fast enough to satiate my appetite. I've been going through your feed for the last couple of weeks while still listening to the latest updates, and I cannot believe the goodies I've missing out on. (laughs) I consider number 11 to be my favorite until I listen to number 131 just today. I try to take anything about the microbiome with a grain of salt, as Alio suggests, but I find myself picking my jaw off the ground after each episode that focuses on it. The way you twimmers present the data and explain the experiments, either good or bad, make them easy to understand for us laymen women. I knew nothing about bacteria other than there are really gross ones in bathrooms, 
until this last year <laughs> when I decided to go back to school for a marketing degree and I fell in love the first time I looked through a microscope. I'm 27, a first year college student, mother of one, starting a career in microbiology from scratch and still can listen to your podcast with some understanding because of how well you present it. Every episode I listen to keeps me hungry for more and so intensely curious about the world that is all around us and is so vitally important as we continue to find out that I sometimes finish an episode almost giddy with excitement over the work that is being done. Episode 131 is one of those episodes. Thanks for taking the time to spread the good word. That is science, and thanks for keeping it accessible. Keep up the good work. Well, that wow. was lovely. What a great email. Lovely. All the best to you, Cindy. Cindy. Number 11, yeah. by the way, was called Chickens, Antibiotics, and Asthma. And number 131, Mice Behaving Badly. That was about the role of microbiome in, in mice in autism-like phenotypes. Steve writes, Hi, Microbies. A research snippet mentioned in this week's Lancet prompts me to get in touch with a couple of questions I've been meaning to run by the team. First, I've been wondering, while reading and hearing all the remarkably technological work going into characterizing the gut microbiota by brute force, why I never heard of gut gas fingerprinting as a more simple method of characterizing the makeup and activity or health of both the microbiota and the host. It seems to me that a cheap and cheerful gas chromatograph mass spec readout from a fresh fecal sample could actually prove to be a very useful diagnostic and research tool. If trace gas composition could be associated with particular microbial communities and disease conditions, maybe microbiome researchers should routinely do GCMS on their samples when they do their PCR, et cetera. It could reap great rewards as the data mounts up. This actually struck me while I was listening to Dixon discussing the foul-smelling diarrhea associated with giardiasis. Most people probably think that all feces smell foul, so how is the patient to describe the degree of foulness? This could be quite important to me as I'm disabled by severe bloating in combination with cramping in the small intestines, but there seems to be no way uh, on offer from doctors to find out what is going on other than occult blood tests and x-rays that show nothing. Colon checks out, but what about the rest? I've had breath tests that were indicative of overgrowth, but not of what by. At the same time, normal bowel movements can give off a powerful, almost petrochemical mercaptan odor, which certainly is foul. seems to me that routine GCMS fingerprinting could remove the uncertainties associated with describing odors. The article that reminded me to ask this was actually on the issue of whether or how much microbial gases control us by the production of gastrotransmitters. So it looks as if gas and trace gas analysis could determine good biomarkers for all manner of purposes. So this is an article um, in The Lancet which he links to called Neuromodulatory Effects and Targets of the C SCFAs and Gasotransmitters Produced by the Human Symbiotic Microbiota. It reminds me that, um, of course, we've talked about a number of papers where people have looked at metabolites and produced by the microbiome, and I guess the gas would just be a fraction of that, right? Yeah, and oh, Dave White, uh, the very famous uh, environmental microbiologist, he actually pioneered using uh, gas chromatography mm. to for the identification of anaerobes. And anaerobes, mm -hmm. of course, make up the bulk mm -hmm. of the microbiome mm -hmm. of our guts. And consequently, what the listener is suggesting isn't all that far-fetched. I think Dave was uh, hampered by the computational power uh, back when he was advocating uh, gas chromatography and the compute power wasn't up to the speed to analyze all of these complex chromatograms. And this is really a variation. And I think uh, Malditoff is one of the first things to make it into the diagnostic world that is using complex chromatograms to identify bacteria. So now all we need to do is to develop those chromatograms using well, gas. Elio, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, I, I remember hearing a paper which dealt exactly with what Stephen is talking about. It was an analysis of the gases may, which are present either in feces or further up, I don't remember. And I'm sorry, I don't remember who did it, but I, such a, there is such a paper, and I think it's worth looking for. But Stephen is spot on. This is really a, it's a missed opportunity if it weren't done, but apparently somebody at least has thought of it and is doing it. Michael, is can you compare um, whole genome sequencing or, you know, PAC bio sequencing to 
metabolomics as far as cost and, you know, what it takes to, you know, the equipment that you need? Is that one of the barriers? Well, Malditoff is you have to build the library and that's the principal barrier and you need the GC uh. mass, you need the GC mass spec in order to get it done. And, but the unit cost, the cost per culture, and it's requiring pure culture technology simply because they haven't built enough of these complex uh, chromatograms. But uh, the major uh, investigators in this field that are, are working on this are indeed trying to look at more complex samples. In the To give you an example, blood culture bottles are now capable of being analyzed by Malditoff while before you had to have a pure culture. Now they're pulling it directly out of blood culture bottles. So the mm -hmm. technology is, is being driven by the market and it's moving from being a research curiosity to becoming a diagnostic reality. And the cost of a Malditoff in terms of, of supplies without factoring in the equipment is about a nickel. And the cost of supplies associated with uh, PAC biosystems, as you well know, any of you out there who are doing routine bench level sequencing is, is probably two orders of magnitude greater, or if not three, over, over a nickel. So but, I so think we're going to see it. It's conceptually, a, it's I think idea, it's coming. But technically, we're just not there yet. We're just not there yet. The compute power is there. It's just building the databases. It, I liken it to where we were in the middle 80s when Norm Pace and Tom Schmidt began their quest on transitioning from 5S ribosomal sequencing to 16S ribosomal sequencing. And Michigan State began to build the database, the 16S ribosomal RNA database that has effectively become, you know, why we're able to do all the great sequencing. And then, of course, the investment by the federal government, principally the Department of Energy and GenBank, where now all those sequences are being deposited and it's become part of the NCBIP um, you know, cohort, the National we're Center getting, for we're getting Biotechnology. We're away from what Stephen was talking about, but it's relevant because if the uh, Maltoc database Maltoc. was sufficient, it would help interpret what gases you find in poop. So, mm -hmm. I think it's, know, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's a, relevant. I think it's a good yeah. idea. I like it. Uh, the second half of his letter has to do with hand hygiene. He first wants to know how do you clean under your fingernails if you go to a public bathroom, and the answer is you don't. You can't really. But that's a good reason to keep your fingernails trimmed, I suppose. But mm -hmm. um, the second part, he talks about how when he was a kid and other kids used to carry coins in their pockets, silver and copper and brass coins. He said there used to be a lot of door handles, handrails, curtain rails, door push plates, pots and pans, keys, locks that were, you know, these metals. And they're all gone now. We don't have a lot of currency and we're switching to plastic. So he says... It seems quite plausible to me that the switch to paper and plastic money and electronic transactions away from the best metal in the coinage that remains, coupled with the near disappearance of decent metal door and window furniture, bathroom plumbing and handrails, could be the single most contributive cause of the modern spread of diseases by contact. What does the team think? Um, well, what do you think? He's Michael? right. He's 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 right there. Um, there was an article published in 2014 in Future Microbiology, and I'll put the reference in the show notes, talking about the concentration of bacteria on paper money and the concentration on average for a U.S. Uh, dollar note is about 10 microbes per centimeter squared, and the risk factor is about 5 microbes per centimeter squared when you run the risk of acquiring that microbe and either ingesting it or transferring it to you yourself by just interacting with your face or your nose or whatever you may have. But other countries out there that don't recycle their money as quickly as the United States dollar note have much higher concentrations of bacteria on paper money. Typically, uh, I think the, the reference is um, the one bank note had as concentration as high as two times ten to the seventh bacteria per centimeter squared, and were you they know, good that's, bacteria or bad? No, they bacteria? were all bad bacteria. They were the <laughs> they were the gram negatives that are traditionally thought to transmit fecal oral disease. 
The U.S. had fecal oral disease as well. Um, the U.S. coins that are made from copper, even the quarters, nickels, and dimes are all principally copper. They're antimicrobial and they typically don't have a very high load of bacteria on them, if any at all. And some of the European coins, because of their color, they actually are indeed, again, made out of copper, but they form um, an oxide that is not ant antimicrobial, and that's the Nordic gold coin that um, the Europeans have for some of their higher denominations of their euros. So he's right, but Vincent lives in New York City and probably occasionally stumbles through Grand Central Station. and. Grand Central Station still has the copper rails, and mm -hmm. I did a study a few years ago asking the question, what's on the rails in Grand Central Station? Because they're the beautiful uh, Art Deco brass rails, and the answer is nothing. There are no bacteria <laughs> on those rails in New York City, so he's right. Were the rails uh, at Penn Station your control? <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. That's a good one. <laughs> that could be, because that's pretty it's much newer i i i take exception to with one statement that Stephen has in his email uh, something speaking about the perceived increase in infectious disease i'm not sure there is such a thing i think we are probably experiencing a period in our at least in developing in developed countries where this is i don't think it's true i think we have no. less disease not more I agree with Elio on that. We we do ha have uh, better hand hygiene than we've ever had before, and I think we're actually seeing it it go down. Well, and and clean water. Well, oh, water is water is the great leveler. Um, I mean, sure. our right. discovery of placing chlorine into water and then understanding the concentration of chlorine that had to be in the water at the tap head really has driven public health to the level that um, we're appreciating yeah. today. Well, I, I, I don't suppose this was a key statement in his letter. So, But I think we need to go out on his PS on the, the weather in England. Yes. Yes, at a sticky 24C as it's better than opening windows and letting the mozzies in. Which reminds me, why do they have six legs when they only use four mosquitoes? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I asked... Dixon de Pommier, he said they use all six legs when they move around. The two in the front are used to help position the proboscis when they take a blood meal, of oh. course. Mm, I don't know. I, I think they use all six, but I could be wrong. If anyone knows, let us know. I love the word mozzies. Mozzies is great, right? Mm. All right, that's TWIM 134. You can find it at iTunes. If you don't use iTunes to, to uh, listen to TWIM, you can use other programs, of course, on your phones. Do us a favor and go over to iTunes and just rate the show there. That helps helps to keep it visible to new listeners who go over to iTunes and discover new podcasts so they can find TWIM there. Uh, we'd love it if you could become a patron of TWIM and all the other shows of Microbe TV. You can contribute as little as a buck a month. You can go to patreon.com slash microbe TV. And, of course, send your questions and comments to TWIM at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. And go blue. Go blue. <laughs> Be gentle to Hawaii. <laughs> Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. My pleasure. This was fun. I learned about hopinoids, which I didn't know about. About time. About time. <laughs> Inexcusable. Michael Absolutely. Schmidt. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. Good luck with the hurricane. Oh, uh, hopefully it just be a little bit of rain. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. I also want to thank the sponsors of this episode, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. Microbiology.